A um, lot of opportunities that I didn't know existed. So I didn't know you could grow up and become a speaker and a writer, so I went into therapy. <laughs> they say in, in counseling programs that most of the people are there because we're trying to get our own selves worked out, and then if we can help other people, praise God. So that's what I did. <laughs> I went through the counseling programs. Um, intercultural studies was another one. I just love language and people and all those fun things. But in my social service program at Fresno Pacific University, I learned the need for foster children. I learned how many kids couldn't find homes in the same county from which they were being removed from birth families. And I thought, man, I, yeah, I want to work in social services, but if I can be one home, one bed or two beds for these kids, like I want to step in and be part of that. And so that's, that's what we did. We went into foster care. We fostered, I should just have this number memorized. I think it was nine kids. We adopted two of those kids, birthed two kids, sometimes had no kids, sometimes had nine kids. So as much as I'm here with some of that therapeutic background, I'm also here as a mama who's been in the trenches, um, still dealing with adult, now raised children of trauma that we adopted. They're now 20, 22 and 21. My word, they were eight when they came in. Um, you know, I was 10 if I had birthed them. Let's just, <laughs> no. So, yeah, that's, that's what brings me here. And really my journey with this topic has been from a place of, wow, this is really hard, and no one else seems to think so. So I'm just going to put my story out in the world and kind of be like, anyone else? And so the very first book I wrote, Reclaiming Hope, Overcoming the Challenges of Parenting Foster and Adopted Children, um, was really that. I couldn't find any pictures of families online that weren't beautifully blended running through fields of wildflowers. I was like, where's the family that looks like mine? Which is like, the door is off the hinge, and you know, some kid's hiding in the closet and we're wiping poop off the wall. Like, where is that picture? We must be really bad parents. And what I learned is we're not. Like, we're actually really, really normal. Um, I don't know who those families are that are running through the wildflowers, but Dan, cheers to them. And, and that's just been what I've done. I've dug in. Every time there's been something I couldn't understand. Why can't this child get this through their head? Um, why am I feeling so triggered? I just dove in and did the research and asked lots of people. And so I think that's important to say as I start here because, again, it's not just from sitting in a classroom with a textbook. In fact, what we're going to talk about tonight is still not really being talked about at all, which is why I'm so excited to bring it here and bring it everywhere, um, because we're still trying talk therapy, like traditional talk therapy for all of the problems, and it's known to be the least effective way to treat traumatic experiences. So we're gonna play a little with that tonight, literally, we're gonna play. I'm gonna talk to you about the brain and why this works, um, and then hopefully I think the more of us who are talking about it, looking for it, the better our homes and families will be. Now I have an ad. So, <laughs> Tiffany, how do I get back to the slides? Oh, yeah, I'm gonna stop. Okay. Is that like, aha, maybe I did it. So here we are. This is the journey of saying, I got it, I think. Is it going? Nope, didn't go. No, please. I just told you about all the, <laughs> the journey. So I'm gonna take you on a journey. We're gonna go through first the brain and survival. Just talk a little bit. I'm gonna get geeky with you, but um, it's fun. There's some animals involved. If you were here when Karen was here, I kind of, interjected a little bit, but I think having language for the brain and being able to simplify it, um, have language that we can bring home, share with each other is really important. So we're going to do that with the brain and survival. We're going to talk a little about what unprocessed trauma is. I'm going to give you some accurate language because trauma gets thrown around so much, and I want at least this room of people to know how to talk about it. But then the impact of that, what does it mean to have unprocessed trauma stuck in our brains? And then we're going to get into the workshop spot where we're going to talk about expressive arts and healing. And I'm going to give you some practice with that. So the next slide just says we're going to do brain and survival. So we'll go to the one after that, too, if you have the opportunity. In your slides, there is a picture. And also in your handout, there's a picture of a brain that has three animals connected to it. There is a, an, an owl, a meerkat, and a tiger. So when we're thinking about the brain and how God designed it for us, we know that our brain is, its only purpose is to keep you alive. It's constantly looking for connections in the world and patterns and associations and tools that it can pick up and file away 
in order to keep you alive. Now, alive can be multiple things. When we think of a threat to our survival, I think our first thought is physical death, right? I'm crossing the street, a bus is coming. Sure, my fight or flight is triggered because I need to get out of the road. But a physical threat to our sense of safety is also identity and belonging. And I want you to remember that because as we're thinking about the pandemic we've been in, that's been very disrupted. Who do we belong with? Where do we belong? Who are we? What's our identity? I was talking about that um, earlier too. Like, what does it mean now? Who are we in the midst of this? And even in our faith communities, there's so much division around it. So where we've always sort of been like, oh, these are my people, even some of that was a bit disrupted. So with your brain and these animals, your prefrontal cortex is represented by the owl. So that's the part up here. This is where your executive functions happen, your cognitive functions. That's where you get to prioritize, cause and effect, delayed gratification. Uh, all of the really important decision-making factors happen there. Most of our kids who've come from trauma don't have an owl or have a very underdeveloped owl. So we'll get into what that means, but another responsibility of the owl is making meaning from language. So if your kid is having a hard time articulating something or getting really frustrated and going to tears instead of words or can't um, receive information, that's the owl not being present. Maybe that's been you <laughs> dealing with your child like, I can't find the words. That's because your owl has been, she's flown away. Mine's a girl, you can, yours can be whatever. My owl has flown away. The meerkat is responsible or represents our amygdala. So that's the emotional center of our brain. That's the meerkat, right, is on the lookout. Where are the threats to my safety? Now your brain is responding or determining what a threat is based on perception. So two people can be in the exact same traumatic event, but it doesn't have to turn into trauma. One person's meerkat can say, oh, no big deal, we can handle that. Another person's meerkat might say, oh my gosh, the world is ending, how are we gonna survive? In which case, where that gets filed in the brain is gonna be different. So your meerkat is, is responsible for alerting the other two animals to what they need to do. That other animal is the tiger, and that represents your brain stem. Again, I'm super simplifying the brain, right? But if you just know these three, you'll be golden. So that's the back of your back right here, connecting to your spinal cord. It was the first part of your brain to develop in the womb. It's the oldest part of your brain. And it's also the part of your brain responsible for all of your automatic functions. Breathing, eating, sleeping. So say your meerkat is perceiving some kind of threat and says to the owl, fly away, get safe and tell us to the tiger, fight, we need you, hop in and fight, or run, <laughs> whatever one's gonna happen. If your tiger is activated, you're gonna have a hard time sleeping. You're going to maybe have some breathing. If you've ever had some anxiety where you can't get deep breaths or you've, um, you're just struggling with breathing, that, that will be an impact of it. Um, eating, forgetting to eat, overeating, whatever it might be. These are your tiger feeling activated and being kind of on edge. One of the ways that I love to use this in my home, because <laughs> I share these with my kids. So say, for example, a child has mis lost a phone. Hypothetically, there's a phone missing. And said child begins to feel panicky about it. Where's the phone? I need the phone. I'm a horrible human if I can't find my phone. My response is normally, keep your owl. Calm down. If she flies away, we won't know where the phone is. She's the only one who knows. Because when the tiger gets activated, your tiger is just get out of the street, right? If, you, if your body is feeling like I need to stay alive, it doesn't need to pause and rationalize, think clearly, think about delaying gratification. It needs to just fight or run away, right? Um, I have learned to recognize this in myself. There are times where I've begun to recognize my own trigger, like I can feel when my meerkat is kind of feeling edgy about something, it's kind of, it's emotional, right? Like I just, I feel that something's a little bit off. Maybe someone said something or it was a social media thing or someone didn't say something. And I can feel when my owl's a little fidgety. And I see that in my ability to, well, my inability, again, to put words to what I'm trying to say, to prioritize, we were talking about some people are wired differently for prioritization anyway. 
But when that turns off and you're just doing stuff that doesn't really matter, that's probably your owl being edgy. And I can kind of tell when she's gone. And so when you can feel that your owl isn't off in a tree staying safe, that is not the time to make decisions. And so the self-awareness around that has been really helpful because often in those times we're feeling pressured to make a decision. But if you can be aware, like, no, I feel like my owl is not with me, then you need to take the time that you can to let your meerkat know things are safe, we're OK. Tiger, go back to relaxing so Owl can come home and we can begin to <laughs> engage the world in a healthy, functional way. And that's OK. I think so often we experience those animals with a sense of shame or judgment. Oh, why couldn't I just say what I needed to say? Like, why did it all come to me later? You know, or, oh, why can't I sleep? Like, I'm on the medication and I keep waking up and whatever it is, and we can judge ourselves for that. When in reality, it's just the way that God has wired your brain and the way that your meerkat is perceiving the things happening around you. So back to the brain, looking for patterns and making associations, that determines how the meerkat experiences things, right? It's sort of looking historically. What has happened before? What are the connections? One example is that during a time of raising my older son, it was just so hard. He'd hit the teen years. We lived in a small missionary community. And his ways of connecting and feeling safe were to slander us and make up stories to get attention. And so we're in this tiny little community, and I just wanted to take a megaphone to, like, the town square and, you know, say the things. And that obviously was not my owl's idea. <laughs> so what was interesting, though, was I fly a lot. And at that time, still flying, but all of a sudden, I have a lot of anxiety on the plane. And I can't figure it out. And again, there's some self-judgment, like, what's going on? I've not had this problem. Why am I so very panicky about being on a plane? And after I spent some time, I mean, it was a number of flights of dealing with that and trying to find medication and being kind of angsty about it. <laughs> I realized my, my brain, my meerkat was connecting the experience of feeling out of control with my son to the experience of feeling out of control on an airplane. Right? Like, it began to go like, oh, hey, have you noticed we're in a little tin can in the sky? And, and there's wind and sometimes, you know, lightning or turbulence. Like, you're not really in control of that, are you? And none of that was cognitive, but it was my meerkat making a connection. So maybe you've noticed there's times where you're in a situation and you're feeling triggered and you have no idea why. Nothing is happening that makes sense to you, but your meerkat has made some kind of connection. And so again, with that awareness, you can bring your awareness to that moment, bring your curiosity to the moment, and ask yourself and God really good questions about what's going on. And he will. He'll show you. He reveals those things. And then, and then I'm not afraid to fly anymore, right? That wasn't overnight, but it began to be something where I could work with my meerkat <laughs> on understanding that these were not connected. Moving on to unprocessed trauma and the impact. So when your tiger responds in fight or flight, and is able to overcome the obstacle, that's great. Your brain did exactly what it needed to do. You didn't get run over by the bus, or you didn't lose your sense of identity. And that memory gets filed away in a part of your brain, in a time and space and history, just in its little filing cabinet. But when the tiger is activated and cannot get away, or cannot fight, and ends up freezing, that is when that event becomes unprocessed trauma. And it's unprocessed because it's still sitting there. It didn't get to move to the healthier parts of the brain, to the other categories. When that happens, your unprocessed trauma gets stuck with the tiger in your brainstem. And think again, your brainstem is, is present, right? It's just those automatic functions. And so your brain actually doesn't have the capability of being in the future or in the past when we, when we get into what ifs about the future, when we get into regrets or about the past, our thoughts go there, but our brain doesn't know how to experience it in the past. So we think of all these affirmations that are around and all this conversation. I thought it was kind of new agey for a while, but the more I understood the brain, the way God designed us is that when we nurture those thoughts, those fears, those future what ifs, we're experiencing them as if they're right now. And when we do that in the past, same thing. Well, this is also what happens with our unprocessed trauma. This is PTSD. This is that person who is trying to function and do normal life, and then there's a backfire in a car, and they're immediately back on the war field. 
The brain, because that unprocessed trauma is stuck there, can only act right now. Complex PTSD is what many of us have experienced and are experiencing or might yet experience. And complex PTSD is the result of being in a traumatic event on repeat over and over. It's not a one-time event. It's just constantly being exposed to traumatic experiences that begin to pile up so that your brain says, I don't know how to keep my identity in this. I don't know how to even maintain my physical body in this. And so that stuff begins to get filed away with our tiger, and then we're not sleeping well, we're not eating well, we're not breathing well, and we're trying to still be healthy parents. So we need to be able to move that unprocessed trauma into the healthier parts of our brain, and we're gonna do that. We're gonna do some of that tonight. We're not gonna get all of it moved, <laughs> but we're gonna touch some of it and give you a practice for what you can do. One example that I like to bring up is um, with my daughter. We, she was having some hip pain, I think it was, and we ended up going to the chiropractor. And he's working on her body and he says, has she ever had an injury to her ankle? And it had been so long ago, I didn't even remember, but she kind of popped out like, oh yeah, a number of years ago I sprained my ankle. And he was like, well, that's, that's what's happening with your hip. You're healed, but your body at the time compensated to protect the ankle, it needed to, it was injured. But then it healed and the body didn't stop compensating. So she continued to live with a limp as a consequence of what originally was so important for the healing of her leg, but never went away. And when I was sitting in that office and this was being told, he was saying this, I thought, oh my gosh, this is us. Like with our unprocessed trauma, we're walking around with this limp that stays so present. The things that are in there were there because we needed them. Our brain said we needed support, we needed help, we needed safety. And so it was protecting an injury, but it just has stayed there even though the event is gone. So one of the ways to begin to move that is through expressive art. And expressive art is not just art. It might be easy to hear that and go, oh my gosh, I came to an art and craft night. Like, I'm not crafty. I'm going to have to make pretty things. And that's actually totally different. Expressive art is giving your brain an opportunity to expose itself once again to the, to the injury, to the event that put that un unprocessed trauma in your brain, but safely. So what your body and your brain need is an experience with the feeling, again, that was part of that event, with the nowness that has stayed present with you, but in the safe spaces with people who can stand witness to support that identity piece. This is where I said earlier, we keep doing like traditional talk therapy. We keep talking to the owls. Well, most of the people in there don't have their owls hanging out in the brains. They're off in a tree staying safe. We need to talk to the tiger. We need to get our tigers engaged in the healing process. Well, our tiger is sensory. So the only way to really touch it is through sensory activity. Now, there's a lot of really great ways to engage our sensory brain, and it doesn't have to just be what's on your table. So if we slide through... I just put up some pictures of options. So you can do drawing, collage, any kind of visual art like that. You can do the next slide. You can do storytelling. And I'm actually going to pause here just a second. Um, I have a, a TEDx talk on this, so I'll just touch on it, and then you can shameless plug. Go watch it. Story is so incredible. Like, now I get why God used it all the time, because he knew how he wired our brains. So when you hear a story, I'll back up. When you hear just data dumps, info dumps, like 7% of your brain lights up, just the info grabbing part. And your brain is just sifting, like what of this keeps me safe? Most of it, not at all, right? So you don't remember some of those presentations later. But when you hear story, like almost your entire brain lights up, including the parts of your brain that, uh, that that represent you actually experiencing what you're hearing. Your brain also then releases dopamine and adrenaline and these feel-good hormones because it knows that in story, you're probably going to learn something for your survival. I mean, story has all those elements, right? There's usually a, a challenge or a problem and overcoming and critical thinking. And so it's like, ooh, ooh, what will we find here that we can tuck away? So the meerkat can use that to better perceive the dangers around. Right? That's also resiliency. Every time you experience something and you overcome it, your meerkat's like, ooh, we learned something. That thing we tried worked. 
let's tuck that away. Well, story does the same thing. It lights up your brain. And so what's so cool about that is when we give story, we have that kind of impact on the brains of the people around us. I mean, think of our children. Well, I might get in trouble here, but that line that like kids are so resilient is so false. Like they're not that resilient. They're flexible and they can be adaptable, but resilience is based on life experience, upon life experience, upon life experience. Well, they're five, seven, ten. They don't have life experience. But one of the ways that we can give it to them safely in our presence and in our home is through the stories that we make accessible to them. When they hear a good story, their brain too is releasing all those feel-good chemicals and it's picking up those tools and techniques and filing it away as life experience. And so we can actually develop resiliency in them just by making the story accessible. At the same time, when we tell story, it's doing a healing work in us too. I just started a program called Called to Proclaim, and it's bringing people of faith together who feel called to tell their story. And I was going through the scripture to look at how many times God tells us to go share, to go tell our story, and there's so many. I mean, we see him do it, but there's so many times where he says, let the redeemed of the Lord go tell their story. Because I think he knows, yeah, it's beneficial to the person listening, but we have to do a healing, wrestling work with our own stories before we can ever share them. So it's, it's a fun little, it's like the carrot. <laughs> I lost all my metaphors living in Germany. It's whatever you do when you switch things around and surprise people. So <laughs> this is for the other people, but actually you're healing too. It's so powerful. Okay, so we can move on from the storytelling. There's body movement. So free dance. Um, it doesn't have to be dance. It could just be moving your body. The important thing about a sensory experience is that you're not censoring it. It's not scripted. It's not choreographed. You're just letting yourself express, and that's activating that tiger who gets to just let something come out. And so some people love moving their bodies. And in your handouts, I think on the second or the back of the front page is a whole list of, of modalities. It's not exhaustive, but ways in which through movement, through visual, through music, you can practice some of these expressive arts. But body movement is one. It's kinesthetic. It's engaging that tiger. Music is the next one. It can be um, you just free playing. It can be you free drumming. You don't even have to have a drum set. Just beat on the table and allowing your body to express itself in any rhythm, in any form, in any volume is touching that tiger and engaging it. Any volume. <laughs> Maybe don't tell that part to your kids if you're going to like pass any of this on, but you might have to be your tiger. Everybody's tiger's got to look out for each other, you know, watch out. Um, and sculpting. You'll notice there's some Play-Doh on the table, but even just taking some, I actually find that I do this a lot on coaching calls. Um, I'm sitting there with some Play-Doh or clay. I'm not necessarily making things out of it, but even just letting yourself play with clay and form something without telling yourself what you're forming, right? Just letting it play through your fingers and see what comes of it begins to engage that tiger. The cool thing about engaging your tiger through these sensory methods is that you're safe. And so it begins to let some of those things out that have been stuck in the safety of this space through the art. And you don't even need someone there to interpret it. So when you think of traditional art therapy, you might think of a therapist who's like, oh yeah, look at Look at how this character is way bigger than all the other characters. That means, you know, that person is seen as powerful and overbearing and better and everyone else is small. Well, that's not how this works. There's no therapist telling you or interpreting what you've created for you. And you don't even need, honestly, I don't know how much they would appreciate this, but you don't necessarily need a therapist there to even guide you through the process. You can bring your own curiosity to what you've created and do some really good work there yourself. And I'll walk you through some of those prompts towards the end of our, of our time playing. <laughs> um, I should have put this picture up, I totally forgot, but this is like another example of play. The kids are so good at this, right? But we, you know, we're grown-ups. We don't play, we work and we work and <laughs> busy. But play is such a healthy part of recovery. So one day, well, I sh okay, so a lot of my life I have loved mermaids. Like I grew up in Southern California at the beach. I was always a mermaid in the water. My friends always played together. And not that long ago, I was on Instagram and there are mermaids in the world, you guys. There are people who like buy fins and swim in them. And I thought, oh my gosh, you're like both living my dream, but also I I'm a little bit embarrassed for you because you're a grown adult in a fin 
swimming places, but I just found myself sort of watching them with both like envy and curiosity and also something else mixed in. So I reached out to one of them and all I, I just messaged her and I, I just said, hey, this is such a beautiful picture. Like you're totally living my bucket list. I'd love to be a mermaid for a day. And long story short, we were in the same city in Southern California at the same time. And she didn't have a package like that, but she said, I'll throw one together. Meet me at the beach, I'll be bring a photographer. And now you have to find me on Instagram to see the pictures. But I did it. Well, the whole week leading up, I was a bit of a wreck. Like, so all the body image insecurity, like I'm gonna be a 40 year old woman on the beach in a fin and not find that so embarrassing. And then like, don't mermaids always look a certain way? And I just, I had so much anxiety. And she said, <laughs> She was like, well, actually, I do this as a kind of therapy for myself. She had come out of a couple abusive relationships and found that learning to let herself play just freed up so much of that and gave her so much life. And as she was sharing this and guiding me through some like steps as the day got closer, I thought, oh my gosh, this is an expressive art. I have to tell people, <laughs> like, it's therapeutic. I'm not just a nerd, although now I am more of a nerd. Um, <laughs> but we'll leave that there. So, <laughs> so there's just so many ways. Again, the idea isn't what you get at the end of it. It's not what, what you're looking at and how nice it looks. It's did you give yourself the space to just express something. It doesn't even have to have anything to do with the problem story, right? You don't have to like focus in on your tiger and go like, what is it we're working on? It doesn't matter, the tiger gets to decide. And he's sensory and kinesthetic and doesn't want you to tell him what to do. And so you just get to play. So when I say that you bring your curiosity to it, you're just asking yourself at the end, like, what, what does this mean to me? Is this teaching me something? What am I feeling in my body as I'm creating or working with this medium? You don't even have to stick with the same one. Maybe you start with one and you shift to the other because that's what you feel like doing, and you just follow it. And again, I find this is so hard for adults because we are so scripted and we're so censor uh, censored, right? We're, we're not used to letting ourselves just exist. We're not used to um, not worrying about what other people will think about anything that we're doing, but especially what we're creating. But tonight, no, tonight we're not worrying about those things. We're going to practice with it playfully. So you can also, um, the last slide was just a pot of soup, which if it comes up, it's fine. It's in your slides. But you can also cook. Like there's a lot of people who maybe aren't following you. Okay, we've got some of you here. I'm like, man, that is so therapeutic. Your brain can just kind of go wherever. Your body's just throwing things in a pot. You're making something that benefits everybody. And that can be another way. So I'm just trying to give you a lot of examples so you're not locked into like, oh, I have to draw to move therapy, like move trauma. No, it's just what for you feels right about putting yourself into a space where you can express yourself. And then do that. The verse, I have a verse up that comes after the soup. This just struck me today. I, it's not one that I'm like, oh, this ties in, but it does. Romans 12, 2 jumped out at me. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I wasn't looking for that, but it jumped out at me. And I think in part because the world would say, like, this is the way we treat it. We talk to each other, you go do the therapy, and you stay an adult. Right? And yet God is calling us into a space of being his children, of coming before him in that sense of safety that he offers and letting go of all of the barriers that we put up to keep our own sense of safety when he is our true place of rest. What does it look like then to renew our minds, to be transformed? Right? It's countercultural. This experience will feel uncomfortable and counter for some of us. Some of us will be like, this is exactly what I needed permission to do. <laughs> you have permission. Um, yeah, so we're going to phase into the playing time. So you'll see on your table you've got paper, you've got pencils, colors, Play-Doh. Again, feel free to go between them or to pick one. But what I would like you to do, well, let me give you first like a bit of a, a low-key agenda. How are we doing on time? Third clock somewhere. We're good? Oh, perfect. Oh, that's great. Okay. So what we're going to do is I'm going to give you just a little bit of a prompt to get your mind thinking, because I know some of you don't want to just, like, come up with something. So if you feel free with, like, I don't need a prompt. I already just know what I want to work on. Great. Um, and then for some of you who just want an idea to get your brain ticking, I will give that to you. After maybe about 15, well, 
I'll play it by ear. I'm going to say like 15 or 20 minutes. I'll have you share just a little bit at your tables. It doesn't have to be the deep, deep stuff, okay? I, and anybody can pass. But for anyone who's comfortable, I'll ask a question or two to have you go around the table. And the reason I'm doing this is at the beginning, I talked about your meerkat's perception of trauma or a traumatic event or a threat, not just being physical safety, but being identity and belonging. There's so much power in a community that stands witness to our journeys. So when you can share any part of your creation process with the people around you, and you get to experience that welcome and that safety, that is healing. It's beginning to dislodge that unprocessed trauma and move it places. It's beginning to give your body an experience again of unity and connection in a pandemic world that has really been fighting against that, right? Like even among us. So that's why I will you know, challenge you, encourage you, but also let you pass in that smaller group time because I want you to experience that part of the healing traumatic experience. And then we'll come together and just do kind of a group debrief a little bit where I'll just ask anyone who's interested to share what that experience was like. And then we'll do some questions and answers. If there's some time, I'd be happy to do that. Um, okay, any, I guess any questions so far before we head into that time? And then I'll give you the prompt. We good? Okay, so for those who need a prompt, I would love it if you would just think over the last three to six months, like what is the first memory that comes to mind that was challenging? A situation you felt, found yourself in that just felt hard. Maybe you judged yourself in it, maybe you felt ashamed in it, maybe you were just frustrated. Um, but bring, bring that to mind and then just pick a medium and do something with it. You don't have to tell yourself the story. You can free write. I talked about storytelling. So for some people, that's just, I need to dump words. Maybe the words are, I know I need to write, but I have no idea what to write. So I'm starting with writing. <laughs> I know that this is the memory that came to mind. This is what happened. And you'll find yourself in a groove, and it'll begin to come out. Okay, if you swear on your paper, it's fine. It's uncensored. I'm not condoning swearing, but I'm saying don't censor yourself. Like, your tiger's got some things to say. <laughs> Someone enjoyed that for me. <laughs> okay. um, but I'm just saying it's so easy, like, oh my gosh, what if Joe Schmo sees this? Well, do what you need to do with it after you've written on it to feel like you can do it uncensored and not have to carry that fear with it if you choose writing. Um, if it's clay, just form it. Like, feel maybe that memory in your body, feel it in your mind, wherever you can, and just form what gets formed. And then, same with colors. Like, if you are more of a visual artist, like, I want to visually express whatever I'm feeling in my body or in my mind or what that memory meant to me, then just put it down on paper in that way. If you don't like prompts and you've already like, nope, I know exactly what I'm doing, go do it. <laughs> uh, that's, that's part of this exercise. Any questions about that? Any? No? We're good? All right. So get creating. I don't know if we have like, yeah. I, there might be pink. Is there pink around the room in the Play-Doh? Oh, she's got pink. There you go. Oh, more pink. <laughs> yeah, feel free to walk around if you need to grab something.
I'm going to give you one more minute, and then I'll give you some questions for your small group, your table. One more minute. Bring you back. Bringing you back. It's been fun to walk around and see some of what you've been making. Um, okay, so for the next maybe five ish minutes at your table, again, for anyone who feels comfortable, feel free to pass if you want to. But I'd love for you to share with each other. Um, I decided I should have picked what question I wanted first. What, when you look at what you've created, is it, is it teaching you anything, or is it saying something to you? Like, just what immediately comes to mind when you look at it? Don't worry about it making sense or being eloquent. It might be like, whatever. I'm not going to put even examples out there. But I would just love for you, if you're looking at it and you see, recognize something in it that it's communicating to you, if you would feel safe and comfortable to share that with your table, go ahead and do that. And then I'll bring you back. I think we'll do one more question after that, and then we'll debrief that as a group. All right, go ahead.
All right. I'm going to feed you your next line for your group. Sorry if I'm interrupting anybody. Good conversation. Uh, the next thing I'm going to ask isn't a traditional part of expressive art therapy, um, but it's definitely just a part of who we are as believers. And, um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pray for you real quick. And then what I want is for you to be aware of any feeling or image that comes to mind or word or anything. But I'm just going to ask God to reveal himself in the story that you told, in the creation that you made. Um, my original prompt was to think of something that's been challenging over these last months. And I know how easy it is to just, our meerkat, right, assigns a perception to that experience and assigns a meaning to it that we then carry around. And yet the reality is the Holy Spirit is in you. He's in that memory with you. And sometimes we just need him to show us where he was. And I've had that practice radically transform my experience with memories. So again, this isn't a traditional piece of it. But I, again, I think as Christ followers, we invite him into the process and see what he says. If you don't hear anything, that's OK. It doesn't mean he wasn't there. He was, and he is. But I imagine some of you will, will have something that comes to mind. And again, if you feel comfortable enough to share that, we'll just spend a couple of minutes with that, and then I'll bring you back um, for just kind of a group debrief and some final thoughts. So I'm going to pray for you, and then just, yeah, just be, just be aware, right? Sometimes he speaks through something that might pop into your head as a, an image. It might be a lyric to a song. It might, make not, it might not make any sense, but we're just going to ask. So God, I thank you for this night and for each person you've brought here. I know that um, c communally we've experienced a global pandemic. We've all experienced something traumatic. And yet in the midst of that, we're living life with these kids that we are desperately trying to love and um, help grow. And yet we've got meerkats and tigers and owls being impacted. And we just, we just want to lean into you. And so as we've come here tonight and practiced with play and, and sort of engaged your design of the brain, I ask that you would bring to each mind a thought, an image, a word, whatever, however you want to reveal yourself to them. But would you show them your presence in that memory, in that experience, or in the creation that they've made here tonight? Give them a chance, Lord, through that word to uh, change the meaning that the meerkat has interpreted and to be able to experience that pain and the injury of that memory. Um, as, as something that you were part of with purpose and with goodness, because that's what your word says. So in your name, Jesus, we ask for that. We thank you in advance for any, any revelation you have for us, any word or thought, or even a feeling, a sense. Um, we know your word is true, and we look for it in our memories. In your name, Jesus. Amen. So if you need to spend a minute with that, you can. If you already know and you want to share, you feel comfortable with your table, go ahead and process what you what you've heard.
right, I'm bringing you back again. <laughs> yeah, I like the conversation, it's good. Would anyone feel comfortable sharing if they did hear or see something where God revealed where he was in your challenging memory? Linda? I mean, I like paying my taxes, so other people can teach my children. Um, and it was just overwhelming, and I wasn't seeing the beauty and the opportunity. Um, but I drew this rainbow because I want God to show me how to do better at seeing all the various experiences as a collective beautiful thing, even if one particular stripe at that moment is not feeling real lovely. He's using it all, and we just need to be patient and wait on that. But even in the midst of it, still try to have a good time. And then if someone would be willing to share, I'd love to know what it was like to share your creation with the people at your table. Would anyone be willing to share what that was like? Should I make eye contact? I always avoid the eye contact because I don't want to get called on. <laughs> There's no pressure, but I, yeah, if anyone would have awareness around what that felt like. It's nice to have a safe place. Yeah, I mean, I heard a lot of good conversation. And the reason that I kind of did it the way that we did was, again, so you could have that experience with people around you just sort of standing witness to your journey, even if you didn't necessarily talk in great detail about what you created or what it means to you. The fact that you gave yourself that space and there was this silent witness around you does a healing work with that, that traumatic piece. So just before we close out, I wanted to touch on a really great question that came up from over here around like our kids, right? Like wh what part of the, <laughs> which animal is it who keeps my kid coming into the room scanning it to know what to steal? Um, or, and one of my kids would do that to scan to steal, but also he was just memorizing every environment we were in, like as a survival skill, right? Like that was something he could control. He could know every detail about where he was. So if I, like he would know if I moved something on a shelf or changed my hair at all, like he'll be that woman's dream man. Like, <laughs> did you get a haircut, honey? Yes, thank you for noticing. He notices all those things, but that was also sometimes really irritating. But it was directions too. We could go somewhere once and he would have memorized how to always get there. And it was just that part of the brain. And so when we're thinking about our kids, like we've talked a little bit about a healthy brain under a great deal of stress. But at the beginning I talked about how some of our kids don't even have owls or they have sleeping owls. And so we're dealing with a brain that, that isn't healthy functioning, right? Or we talked about a meerkat's perception. So for a lot of our kids who've come from trauma and I talk about this in Parenting Children of Trauma, one of the books over there too. Um, their meerkat is perceiving demonstrations of love as a threat to survival. Because the very first people who were supposed to take care of them and keep them safe didn't. And so their meerkat immediately made that connection. Oh, then everybody who's supposed to keep me safe and love me is actually going to kill me. And so you demonstrate love and it triggers their meerkat to think, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. And they do this, I love you, I hate you. The I love you is because they're still God's children. Like, they've been wired for connection and love. And I realize that can sound really hopeless and discouraging. Like, what? Every time I love my kid, they're going to do crazy things? Like, yes. But also, <laughs> um, you are giving them such an opportunity and a path to experience their own stuff safely. And you are learning how to experience their stuff safely. And so if there's an encouragement, and I'm still wrestling with this too, right? Like my kids are grown and they're very much on their own journeys. And I, I don't see their journeys as reflecting what I wanted for them. So I have to wrestle with that. Like what was this all about? But there's a tether. Like I know there's a love tether that binds us, even if it's just like at a soul level. Like none of those the love pouring that we did is wasted. Even if we know for a while we're navigating kids whose meerkats are trying to, trying to understand it. 
And if you can find a therapist doing this kind of expressive artwork, that's going to be one of the most effective ways of, of getting to it. Same with EMDR, right? We've heard a lot about that. That's not new, and I know there's a number of therapists in town, but it's moving around the things in the brain to get them categorized where they belong. EMDR is eye movement desensitization, or with the R on the end. So it's, it's, usually, it's using eye movement because your eyes and the muscles of your eyes actually have an impact on how your brain is filing things. And so they'll use you to tell story and direct your eyes in different positions. Sometimes you're doing movements, cross-body movements, and it helps to file those things away. So I just wanted to end there that I think a lot of our work is this for ourselves, reorienting our expectations of our kids. So we're not just like, what's wrong with you? We just go like, yeah, you don't have an owl. So what does that mean for me to be able to be healthy and to show up in this space to care for you and love you in a healthy way? And that can look a variety of ways. So that's that. There is a table over there. There are stickers and books. There's a children's book, Speranza's Sweater. I think I brought it the last time I was here, but it's a foster dot book. Um, and yeah, feel free to check those out. And thank you. Thank you so much, Marcy. Are you able to stick around for a little bit more? Do you got to roll? Okay, so. Uh, let's do this. It's 8 o'clock right now, so 8.02, so let's go get the kids, and if anybody wants to hang around and ask Marcy some other questions, uh, please feel free to. Um, it would be helpful if make sure you kind of bust your area if there's a bunch of stuff, and in about 15 minutes, we'll start breaking down if anybody is interested in hanging around and helping us get this place flipped. That would be awesome, too. So God bless you all. Have a wonderful, wonderful night. Thank you for coming, and we look forward to seeing you guys next week, next week, next month, next month, next month. Next month, last Thursday of the month, not the fourth, the last, last Thursday of the month. All right, God bless you all.